first reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith. Why do you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you have received is not a spirit of slavery, leading you back into a life of fear, but a spirit of adoption, enabling us to cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit of God affirms to our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. But we must share his suffering if we are also to share his glory. Here ends the reading. Sisters and brothers, I'm glad to be here today as I prepare to end my time with you. I need to thank you again for welcoming me, for allowing me to be here with you on my journey and on yours. The scripture today is about a journey. Now, first I need to tell you a little something about me. As some of you know, I'm from the South. And the South is fundamentalist country, at least where I come from. And according to the fundamentalist reading of the gospel event, the miracle stories are there as evidence of Jesus' divinity. Jesus has command over natural forces, the miracles tell us. So therefore we should have faith that he is indeed the Son of God. And if we have faith, well then we are entitled to receive the benefits of the sacrifice. The gospel story is about Jesus marching to his death, fundamentalist reading of the scripture tells us, and so blood was spilled to appease an angry God, and if we have faith, then we can benefit from that sacrifice. All we have to do is believe in Jesus. But I believe that there is much more to it than that. The Jesus story is more than about a, a blood sacrifice and the wrath of God. Scripture is more than a, a demonstration of God's power, a proof. And understanding takes more work, more thought and contemplation. Jesus did more than just march to his death. He called together a church, and then he gave it a mission. So the task of Christian contemplation, of preaching and hearing the word, is to discern not just who Jesus is, but also who we are and what we are to do, what 
is our mission as people of God, as inheritors of the kingdom, co-inheritors with Jesus, as the letter to the Romans tells us. Fortunately, we have a text to guide us in this way. In the text, there's a boat. Now, we need to know that throughout the Gospels, the boat is a symbol of the church. Jesus even used the boat as a pulpit once in Luke. Jesus gathered his friends and his followers together and sent them out in a boat. In this story, the apostles go ahead in a boat and uh, Jesus walks ahead, walks ahead on the sea, but the, the sea is windy stormy. The boat was battered by waves and, and it was blown off course. It was not where Jesus wanted it to go. So Jesus walked toward the boat on the water, but not all the way on the boat. And this is important. He stood apart. Now, personal agendas often get in the way of being able to be with Jesus, following Jesus, and doing the work to which we've been called. Peter had a personal agenda. You may remember that Peter was always in competition with John, the one whom Jesus loved. Peter always wanted to outperform him. To, he, he wanted to, uh, to, to perform a miracle. He wants to be the favorite. He wants to be recognized. He wants to share in Jesus' glory, but not in the risk. But Jesus doesn't feed Peter's ego, as Jesus often does. He uses this as an opportunity to teach. So when Peter wanted to prove himself the greatest, Jesus said, okay, come. Often in scripture there's a single word or phrase that is in fact the, the interpretive key to the entire story. And this is that key, come. What a powerful word and, and, a, and a central message in the scriptures. Has anyone here been called? You have? We all have. The first lesson of the scripture is that Jesus calls his disciples to follow him. Jesus beckons to Peter and says, come. But from here, things don't happen quite the way that Peter had planned. Things get rough in the water. Peter notices the wind. It had been there before, but he was in the safety of the boat. He didn't, it wasn't as troublesome to him. Remember that the boat is a symbol for the church. So Peter felt safe in there, but he was scared on the way to where Jesus was calling him. He became afraid and he started, he hesitated, and he started to sink. But Jesus was there. Peter called for help and Jesus reached out his hand. Peter was safe but humbled. He made it back to the safety of the boat with Jesus' help, but he never did make it to the place where Jesus had called him. When we are on our way to Jesus, the only thing that can sink us is our own fear, hesitation, concern for losing the stability that we have, the decision to follow Jesus, not just believing in Jesus, but following Jesus is a radical move which requires almost a reckless abandon, a leap of faith. And this is the second lesson of the scripture, hesitation, fear, concern for our comfort keeps us from making the full decision to follow Jesus. Third lesson of this particular story has to do with where Jesus is leading us. If the boat represents the church, then the rough waters of the sea represent the real world of which the church is a part. Like the sea, the world is a chaotic place. 
even dangerous sometimes, but that is where Jesus is, calling us to follow him. Jesus do it outside the boat. This is key. Jesus did not go into the boat. He stood outside, calling us to follow him out into the waters. Into the chaotic, uncertain waters of the world in which we live. Peter wanted the glory of Jesus, but he did not want the risk of venturing out into that uncertainty. Now, I want to tell you a personal story. There was a time in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when AIDS was ravishing the world. And it was became very clear that the quickest way to transmission of HIV was through the sharing of infected needles. There were groups of us around the country who made the commitment to go to where people were and distribute clean hypodermic needles to them, not to encourage drug use, but so that if until they can get to the point in their lives when they can stop using the drug, they at least can slow the spread of HIV. So we went into neighborhoods that often were not the neighborhoods in which we had grown up. My particular route was in a place called the Combat Zone in Boston. This was the Red Light District, a place where prostitutes and, and uh, hustlers and drug dealers go. But this is where Jesus was, I believe. And so we went to the Combat Zone partner and I and exchange needles. And my mother did not like this. People said, what are you doing? You can't go in that neighborhood. It's dangerous. But it's where I had to go because it's where Jesus was calling me. And it didn't matter that it was an uncomfortable place to be. It's where the work of God was for me at that time. When I came into the United Church of Christ, I was, I was struck by the statement of faith that spoke to us. This congregation has recently become a member of the United Church of Christ. And we have a statement of faith, not as a test, but as a, as a witness to what we believe. <clears throat> and, I, and I want to read to you one part of that statement of faith. God calls us into the church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be the servants in the service of the whole human family, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, to resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at Christ's table, to join in Christ's passion and victory. To really follow Jesus, means to go where he beckons, even if it seems uncertain, frightening, unfamiliar. We are not called to cling to the safety of the church, of these walls, but to venture forth into a dying world, to carry a message of responsibility, of hope, freedom. Our mission is not the maintenance of our own comfort, but the healing of the world outside these walls. Following Jesus does not mean like the Gnostics believed in the first century that we withdraw from the world. It's true, Jesus did begin this story by going to pray, going alone, but he didn't stay there. He prayed to receive the guidance and the strength he needed to then go out and teach and minister. Following Jesus means sometimes we go into uncharted territory, into the real world of suffering, death, 
It means that we struggle against life-denying structures in the real world of human politics. It means that we follow our conscience, if that is to protest against the death penalty, to begin a prison ministry, to volunteer at a homeless shelter, work for a political campaign if we believe that the candidate represents what we believe is true and right, to follow Jesus into the rough waters of the sea means to educate ourselves about gentrification, about the devastating effects of of global warning, the genocidal effects of free trade. It means that we speak out when our church becomes corrupted by its own success, like when Jesus overturned the money tables. It means being willing to forego our own privilege in order to be of service. It means that we be willing to leave the safety of our own nests in order to be more faithful to Jesus' call. And so the gospel message is good news in the sense that it promises a reconciliation with God and a sharing in God's glory to the extent that we follow the path of Jesus and that we work toward the kingdom of God here on earth. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be a comfortable or an easy journey. Being a Christian is not about seeking pleasure. It's not about making sure that we maintain our own comfort levels and blissfully await the rapture. We have to be uncomfortable sometimes and willing to risk our lives to be faithful, perhaps. The irony is that only when we give our will and our lives over to the care of God, only when we stop seeking our own comfort and start seeking the path to Jesus, Only then can we be truly happy and safe. And even if we become afraid, we don't hesitate. For Jesus' hand is always ready to pull us up to meet him, if we are ready. Amen.